Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. You're about ready to begin. You know, one of the things I am loath to do, especially in the first couple of days of Mises University, is talk about anything political or normative, my viewpoints and so forth. Uh, a lot of that has to do with my dark past. Uh, but here today, I do want to open with the idea that, yes, the minimum wage, the federal minimum wage law has lost a little bit of steam in terms of its appearance in the media. But politically, we live at a point in time where we might actually be able to repeal the federal minimum wage law. And I say that because former President Trump has indicated his support for eliminating the taxes on tip money. And so part of the analysis that I'm going to open up here with is to show you, in part, why the potential for actually repealing the minimum wage law is a very real political possibility. Now, one of the reasons we talk about the federal minimum wage law is because it's something that most people are familiar with. It's something that's discussed at great length at a lot of introductory economics courses in colleges, even in high schools. Uh, it's a law, it's a phenomenon that exists in many European countries as well and other countries around the world. And this has been a policy problem in the world for well over a century. In Mises's book, Human Action, on page 604, I'll quote at length, quote, we can well imagine an historical situation in which the height of wage rates is forced upon the market by the interference of external compulsion and coercion. Such institutional fixing of wage rates is one of the most important features of our age of interventionism. But with regard to such a state of affairs, it is the task of economics to investigate what effects are brought about by the disparity between the two wage rates. The potential rate which the unhampered market would have produced by the interplay of supply and the demand for labor on the one hand, and on the other, the rate which external compulsion and coercion impose upon the parties to the market transaction. So Mises says here that it's a very important part of modern society. It's, a, it's an important problem. And in, most importantly, it's, an, it's a problem in which economics is used to investigate what are the effects. And notice that, in particular, he refers to the effects, not the single effect. That's also going to be an important component uh, of today's lecture. So we look at the minimum wage law. It hasn't been changed in a long time in the United States at $7.35 an hour at the federal level. And then for tip jobs, it's $2.13 an hour. Uh, but of course, it usually involves a lot of tip income. And then there are states that have higher levels, even local governments that hi have higher levels uh, than that imposed by the federal government. Uh, some of the things that we want to learn today are about the many distortions and adverse effects of the minimum wage law. Now, I don't call them unintended effects because the early progressive thinkers in the United States, roughly a century ago, they very much intended these particular effects. In other words, the early American progressives wanted to keep blacks and minorities out of the workforce, out of industrial jobs, out of good paying jobs, keep women, children, and minorities 
out of the good paying jobs using minimum wage laws to essentially keep the best jobs for white men. Okay, so this was a philosophy of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant majority in the United States to keep blacks, Mexicans, Hispanics, children, women out of the factories and the good high paying jobs. And plus, the minimum wage is just an example of all of the government interventions that we face in the economy. So what you've been looking at so far is a lot of the theory uh, that Austrian economics lays out for you, the methodology of the Austrian school. And then more specifically, you've looked at the division of labor, how labor is divided up to make us more productive, how entrepreneurs organize labor and production to make it more productive. We're going to be looking at capital and all of the other aspects of the economy, how they all come together. Uh, but of course, at the foundation is labor and labor markets. They're the most uh, ancient forms of production is land and labor, and particularly labor. Labor is the sort of the oldest factor of production. And also that we are winning this policy battle, that um, more people, more economists um, oppose the minimum wage on economic grounds. Now, some of them will actually say, yes, minimum wages cause discrimination, and they cause unemployment, but we still advocate it as a sop to the poor and the unemployed and the, the young and so forth. Um, so we haven't won the battle, uh, but we are winning the battle, except in the CHTs. Um, this is a map of the United States. Um, CHTs is, uh, is an old acronym from the 50s and 60s. It refers to uh, during the Korean War and the Vietnam War to communist-held territories. Um, <laughs> You know, so we see, you know, the left coast. Um, the left coast is where they have very high minimum wages. The northeast, uh, dominated by Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and, uh, of course, Washington, D.C. And then there are some wayward states out here in the west, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Colorado, where the states generally oppose things like the minimum wage, but they're dominated by one particular county uh, population-wise and government employee-wise and, and ideologically. And so the state flipped um, from normal and smart to communist. Okay, so for a little perspective on this, the US population is 333 million people. The labor force is roughly half of that at 165 million. So there's about half of the population is technically in the workforce. Of those, about half of that group are hourly workers. Now, of course, everybody works in some sense by the hour, but hourly workers are paid by the hour. And so that makes up about half of the labor force. Minimum wage workers, those people working and actually earning um, $7.35 an hour is only 0.2% of hourly workers or only 0.1% of the labor force. So it's a very, very teeny a uh, small amount of the workforce that we're talking about, politically in entirely insignificant. Most of those people also do not vote. Um, and of those people who earn $7.35 an hour, only 0.02% work full time. Okay, so it's very, very small. Of the 3 million people in the United States 
who earn $10 or less, so just low wage workers, not minimum wage workers, but low wage workers, only 15% of that small number live anywhere close to the poverty line. Live, excuse me, live in families or households that live anywhere close to the poverty line, at, below, or slightly above the poverty line. Twice of that number live in households that earn more than $100,000 a year. So the majority of the people who earn the minimum wage or up to $10 an hour are actually in middle class or well-to-do households. So again, we're not talking about the poverty-stricken, down and out, um, something that we really need to feel sorry about. These are the majority of those um, in the $100,000 households are college bound teens. Now tip workers are actually a much larger percent. Okay, so tip wages apply to the minimum wage. They make $2.13 an hour and then they make most of their income on tips. That's um, six times the number uh, compared to those that are making $7.35 an hour. And of those, roughly a little bit more than half of them are adults. And the adult population of tip workers are actually earning, for the most part, breadwinner type incomes. So they're earning low to mid, lower middle to middle uh, income uh, for the households. So it's our purpose here today to dispel some of the ideology used to promote uh, the minimum wage. And I point you, in this case, to chapter 21 of Human Action, where Mises discusses work and wages at great length. And I highly recommend everybody read that chapter very carefully, go back and highlight it. Uh, it's still incredibly fresh and relevant to today. Uh, he points out in detail with examples that we all work for the consumer. We all work for the consumer indirectly. Indirectly, the consumer is ultimately paying uh, incomes and is responsible by their spending patterns uh, for shifting incomes around. So wealthy people, just as much as low uh, income or low skilled people, uh, their wage rates and incomes are tied uh, more or less directly to the decisions of consumers. Entrepreneurs, in some sense, don't really care. They're looking to find the best combination of capital, labor, and other resources to put them together to best serve and profit from the consumer. So if uh, Tesla is looking to test out a certain part for its cars and it wants to test that part to make sure it's going to work for a certain amount of time, and uh, they want to do that as cheaply as possible, you know, whoever's in charge of Tesla, I, I don't remember who that is, but they might decide to go with a robotic system with computers and, you know, all sorts of fancy equipment to test that part to see if it's going to work for, say, the next five years or the next 10 years. Um, but it may also be the case that it might be cheaper to fly those parts uh, over to Bangladesh and to have uh, handicapped children test those parts without any kind of technology at all. And believe me, if the entrepreneur found out that those children uh, found a more accurate way of testing those parts and could do it cheaper, 
then Tesla and other companies would ship those jobs over to Bangladesh and rather than having the robotic, computerized, high-tech version. Okay, entrepreneurs want the best service for their production at the lowest cost. So if that was the case, then the entrepreneur would ship those jobs over to Bangladesh. And if we were to perhaps, or Bangladesh was to perhaps, to prevent that from increasing by increasing their minimum wage and preventing their disabled children from testing those parts, what would happen? They wouldn't get the job, they wouldn't get the income, those jobs would come back to the United States where robot makers and laser operators and uh, you know, computer testing services would get those jobs. So the jobs would go to higher skilled, higher capitalized, more affluent workers here in the United States if Bangladesh imposed a minimum wage um, on their workers and put their children out of a job. Mises explains very clearly that wages are based on competition and they are, de they are dependent upon productivity of labor. What is the marginal product of labor? If I hire another worker, how much total production will my firm experience by hiring that additional worker? And then I look at how much we can produce, and then also I want to know, well, what's the price of my product? So I get an idea of how much revenue is going to be generated from hiring that additional worker. Can I afford, based on that additional revenue, can I afford to hire that additional worker? This is something you've come across already, marginal re revenue product. You're going to see it again, uh, but it's a very important uh, concept in economics uh, that involves, obviously, reality in the real world, and it also involves marginal analysis. The entrepreneur projecting out, can I hire more? What is the production? What's the revenue? What's the return? Is it worth it? hard, cold, facts, and projections. Now, the marginal product of labor, this is very important as well. The marginal product of labor depends on the amount of capital that's in the firm and that the labor has available to produce, OK? So the more capital the labor is working with, the more technology, the more power they have, the more efficiency uh, they can produce with. So capital is an important ingredient. More capital, capital accumulation in the firm by the individual or the economy as a whole is going to make everything more productive. And it's that higher level of productivity that's going to result in higher wages. The only thing that can systematically increase wages, really, across an economy is capital accumulation. So in this chapter 21, Mises is arguing against the Marxist per, uh, perspective. He's very much advocating for the capitalist perspective. He goes right to the heart of the matter, more capital, means more productivity, that means higher wages. You would have to be very ignorant to miss that fact if you look around the world, the countries and the firms with the most capital are the most productive and they pay the highest wages. Capitalism um, is a system that results in rising wage rates and no catalectic unemployment. So there's no unemployment in terms of jobs in the marketplace in a free and unhampered market economy. We only get those bad kinds of unemployment as a result of various forms of government intervention uh, and the worst one, of course, is with the business cycle. 
He also points out the opposing theory about people and wages. I call it the chattel theory of people and wages, uh, where the perspective is that the people are a non-land form of property. So not your house, not your farm. Uh, chattel very often refers to slavery. So it's the slavery perspective on people and wages. And I'll quote from Mises on page 602, yet it is possible to attach some meaning to the ideas implied by the iron law of wages, which means we can only pay subsistence to our labor. If one sees in the wage earner merely a chattel and believes that he plays no other role in society, if one assumes that he aims at no other satisfaction than feeding and proliferation, sex, and, and does not know of any employment for his earnings other than procurement of those animal satisfactions, one may consider the iron law as a theory of the determination of wage rates. In fact, the classical economists frustrated by their abortive value theory could not think of any other solution to the problems involved. So he draws the distinction between capitalism and this earlier perspective of people as chattel or slaves, and he brings it all the way back to those problems of value theory that you've already seen discussed here this week. Now, the U.S. debate on the minimum wage is a very static, narrow uh, debate that's almost super superfluous. It's very frustrating from an Austrian economist the way it's actually debated between mainstream economists or the way it's debated in the media, uh, online, social media, and so forth. It involves a very short-term analysis, which is really not all that relevant. It involves really a wage and quantity of labor analysis. Um, in fact, Janet Yellen said this when she was uh, appointed to the, be the U.S. Uh, Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. She said, economists all agree that we just think of the minimum wage debate in terms of wages and employment. That's very, very narrow. It's very, very singular. Uh, it's also statistically based only, and it eliminates many of the confounding factors that Austrians think are important. So really, only the Austrian view here um, is going to give you a full and complete view of the minimum wage debate. Uh, because you have, on one side, the hysterical view that workers are being abused, uh, that they're paid below subsistence, that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and so on. Um, and then there's the empirical mainstream view that generally says that the minimum wage causes unemployment. The Austrians take a theoretical view, and we agree, we agree that the minimum wage can cause unemployment, but there are bigger issues at play. But the basic reality is, for labor in general, is that you cannot increase pay and benefits by legislation. You can only distort markets. So this mainstream, mainstream perspective is sort of the two-handed economist. On the one hand, you have those who say, quote, there's just no evidence that raising the minimum wage costs jobs, at least when the starting point is as low as it is in modern America. This apparent defiance of the laws of supply and demand occurs because, quote, the market for labor isn't like the market for, say, wheat, because workers are people. And then on the other hand, the right hand, Quote, any Econ 101 student can tell you the answer. The higher wage reduces the quantity of labor demanded and hence leads to unemployment. Clearly, these advocates of the minimum wage law very much want to believe that the price of labor, unlike the price of gasoline, 
Manhattan apartments can be set based on considerations of justice, not supply and demand without unpleasant side effects. So you have the left-handed view and the right-handed view. You've probably all seen his picture. It's the same one as that. Paul Krugman actually holding both beliefs. So economic analysis, uh, this is the standard diagram that you're going to see in an introduction to economics uh, with supply and demand for labor, with the minimum wage set higher than the equilibrium wage, creating unemployment. So of course, the amount of unemployment is going to vary based on the elasticities or the shape of those two curves. So I could have drawn those two curves differently if I drew them more elastic or more vertical rather than horizontal, there would be less of a quantity effect. So that would affect the amount of unemployment that you would get uh, from a given uh, minimum wage or a given increase in the minimum wage. The amount of unemployment of the people who lose their job and the people who enter the workforce in order to get that higher wage means that there are a lot more people looking for the job. Say we increase the federal minimum wage from $7.35 an hour to $27.35 an hour. Okay, that would be a, a, an increase to make the minimum wage binding or effective that would cause uh, some businesses to fire workers, that would cause a lot, some employees uh, or non-employees to enter the marketplace. So there'd be a lot more people wanting jobs than able to get those jobs. And anytime the market is not doing that clearing, in other words, if wage rate is not the determining factor, of who gets the job, then employers will use their own discriminating tastes to decide who gets the job and who doesn't get the job. So that's where we tend to see, uh, for example, minorities being hurt by the minimum wage. That's where we tend to see young people getting hurt um, by the uh, effects of an effective minimum wage. And so discrimination um, proliferates uh, the more effect the minimum wage has. And what we've seen as we haven't increased the minimum wage uh, for almost uh, over 25 years, that the real purchasing power of the minimum wage has eroded away over time, and the amount of discrimination has been reduced. In other words, the difference between white teenage unemployment and black teenage unemployment, uh, the difference between those two demographic groups has shrunk because there's less discrimination in those, in those markets. We also see uh, from an effective minimum wage a substitution effect where high skill production is encouraged, is more profitable than high school production. Okay, high school students are generally not, they don't have a lot of experience, they don't have a lot of skills. Um, and as a result, we usually classify them as low-skilled workers. Well, low-skilled and high-skilled workers can substitute for one another. The example of Tesla testing some of its parts, either in Bangladesh, done by children, or in some souped up high tech factory here in the United States illustrates that point. Entrepreneurs are gonna go for the least cost, okay? Now Elon Musk is probably, you know, if it's high tech enough, he'll buy into anything. But um, ultimately, entrepreneurs with a more level-headed 
approach are going to go with whatever is the most cost effective uh, at that time. So in addition to that, we want to look at job quality. The minimum wage can affect the number of hours that you work or the types of shifts that you have to work. It can also affect benefits. How many, what are your benefits from a job, uh, which is a quality of a job, and also working conditions. What are the working conditions in your job? A higher minimum wage may actually reduce the number of hours you get to work, or screw up your shifts, or reduce your benefits, or make your working conditions worse as a result, as a way of paying for those higher minimum wages. So there's a lot of things that mess up the statistical short-term static analysis that mainstream economists are always constantly engaged in. And they tell us, you know, at the end of their models, well, you know, we gained 10,000 jobs or we lost 15,000 jobs. Uh, again, that's not um, the total story. And the results of those studies um, are highly tenuous. They assume that conditions before and after the minimum wage are essentially the same, ceteris paribus. These, the minimum wage only affects a teeny part of the labor market. And as I pointed out, entrepreneurs can substitute capital, they can substitute high-skilled worker, they can substitute foreign production for domestic production, all sorts of things. In other words, if we forced American employers to pay higher minimum wage for low-skilled jobs, they might just ship the low-skilled jobs across the border. So all of those numbers tend to be very small um, and tend to get offset or confused by increases in the demand for labor generally, uh, increases in population, increases in economic growth, price and wage inflation, um, there are lots of things that impact short-term real things that impact short-term unemployment rates and make these static analysis very uh, tenuous and sometimes misleading. So the minimum wage can cause a lot of different effects. I'm just going to quickly go through some main ones here. Uh, the, empl the employee may get a higher wage rate, but end up with fewer hours. There may be fewer jobs. There may be fewer employers in the area because small businesses tend to get eliminated by the minimum wage. There can be decreases in job benefits, such as health insurance, vacation days, sick days, company-provided uniforms, etc. The minimum wage can decrease job desirability. For example, making work harder and more concentrated. In high school, I was a dishwasher at a hospital cafeteria. And the full-time regular employees, they worked an eight-hour shift. And they had two very long breaks after breakfast and after lunch. And then we, the high school students, came in after dinner, and we worked our butts off for three hours. Okay, we didn't get that time off, and it was a concentrated, harder work uh, effort period of time. Uh, there can be less advancement, less sanit sanitary conditions, and believe me, at a hospital cafeteria dishwasher job, those were not very sanitary <laughs> conditions. Um, Things like less lighting, air conditioning, all sorts of things. The list is really um, unlimited. There's a famous study called the Card-Kruger study, which was published in 1994. It had to do with a state increase in the minimum wage in New Jersey in 1992, which raised the minimum wage in New Jersey from $4.25 an hour to $5.05 an hour. Cardin Kruger took 400 fast food restaurants on either side of the Pennsylvania-New Jersey border 
and they got data on those 400 restaurants and they called it a natural experiment. It wasn't really a true natural experiment, but they felt that it was close enough. And what they found was that unskilled jobs in New Jersey increased after the increase in the minimum wage from $4.25 an hour to $5.25 an hour, and they declared the laws of economics were no longer valid, basically. Uh, and it sent shockwaves uh, through the economics uh, profession because the economics profession generally believes, you know, the, the minimum wage story, but they also very much believe in empiricism or a data-based approach um, and that the data can actually falsify uh, the theory. But of course, this wasn't a natural experiment. It wasn't ceteris paribus conditions. Uh, time took place. Uh, various things changed, uh, and they probably changed differently in Pennsylvania than they did in New Jersey. Uh, those were two different locations with two different types of economies. The fundamental uh, components of the two economies were different. Um, and so you could very easily have had a substitution effect where you might have gotten more low-skilled jobs in New Jersey, more of low-skilled jobs, but you might have lost some high-skilled jobs. So a fast food restaurant may have only one manager rather than two or three on a shift. And in Pennsylvania, you may have had an increase in high-skilled jobs as fast food restaurant managers migrated from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. And you could, so you could have these cross-border effects where unskilled workers in Pennsylvania simply commuted a few miles across the border to get jobs at the $5.05 an hour. So it could have been just a substitution effect or a cross-border effect. And as a matter of fact, Hoffman and Trace uh, in 2009 published an, an article where they showed that the subsequent increase in the minimum wage uh, across the board showed that it obviously had the traditional negative effects uh, on the low-skilled workforce in Pennsylvania where, you, you, uh, where they experienced unemployment and job discrimination uh, as a result. <clears throat> um, Hugh, Mankid and Shunko in 2021 published a, uh, an article in the Harvard Business Review on higher minimum wage leads to lower compensation. And so they looked at employment in fashion chain stores and they looked at increases in the minimum wages experienced and they did find an increase in wages obviously, but what they found was that the hours per worker, so you got a increase in your pay rate but the number of hours you worked fell. Um, and as a result, um, a lot of workers' hours per week fell below the 20-hour minimum for retirement benefits, so they lost their retirement benefits. And many others um, fell below the 30-hour threshold and lost their health care benefits. So they found, the authors found, that the stores recouped almost 30% of the increase in the minimum wage just by eliminating those two benefits. There were also other unpleasant things to do uh, with the minimum wage in that study. Uh, this paper in the Journal of Human Resources looked at the long run effects and they found that the long run effects of experiencing jobs on the minimum wage actually reduced your career earnings as a result. I'm not going to go into any details about that, but uh, another study looked at the average unemployment rate in European countries with and without minimum wages. And what this graph shows is that countries without minimum wage laws had uh, lower unemployment rates 
as a result. Now, in Europe recently, they passed some law that uh, states have to uh, homogenize their wage policies. And so there have been a lot of increases in minimum wages in various countries. Uh, there's also been some distortions about migration and so forth. It would probably make an excellent like master's thesis to investigate what's been going on in Europe since the passage of that new uh, law. Because it's unclear, just looking at the numbers on the surface, how that all works out, given that you have some countries without any minimum wage at all, other countries with minimum wage, and another group with significant increases in the minimum wage, and also a lot of cross-border migration. So, um, you know, I've been uh, studying the minimum wage, I've been teaching the minimum wage for a long time, and I find it harmful, racist, sexist, and completely unnecessary, and I would love, even if it was just to be discussed in the uh, upcoming political season, to eliminate the federal minimum wage, because it applies to almost nobody, and it has a horrific history of discrimination and it has all sorts of uh, distortions in the economy, uh, which makes for a great illustration in college courses, but it's, it's maddening to small business. And I'd love to see that taken out of their hair and for them to um, have more say-so in what goes on in their own particular business. So it's a good illustration um, of all the confusion that's caused in the economy, uh, theory that the Austrians put forth and that Mises describes in human action is a great starting point. Uh, the minimum wage has disadvantaged the young, the poor, and the minorities, and that's what the progressives intended. It's a pro, it's a pro union, pro white male, uh, Protestant, at least initially. Uh, uh, point of view to uh, push uh, the young, women, the poor, and minorities out of good, high-paying jobs. It also exposes the mistakes and the views of mainstream economists uh, and their methodology. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you here about it this afternoon. Thank you very much. question. How do we go about abolishing the minimum wage laws and why do the politicians in Washington support these laws knowing the harm that it does? Well, they don't as much anymore. It's become a state's, a state prerogative, which is another thing in its favor. So the states have make, been making the adjustments to the minimum wage. In places where the cost of living is higher, they've been able to raise the minimum wage and get away with it without causing too much unemployment. So that's just another justification for the feds to leave this field. Um, and then, of course, then you bring um, you know, the analysis onto the states. But for as far as the federal uh, government and the federal law is concerned, it applies to almost nobody, and it has a horrific history behind it, and it's very much ill-intentioned uh, from the start. So I think it's a great time that we make that case, that politicians can make that case in conjunction with uh, removing the tax on tip incomes. And then all of a sudden, You've got all waitresses and waiters all across the country supporting this. Uh, what would you say, so a common argument I hear is uh, like some of the Nordic countries don't have minimum wage, right? But they still have very high wages on average. That's uh, oftentimes because of unions who uh, organize to push for higher wages. So what would you say to someone who say, yeah, even if the feds get out of the minimum wage um, uh, uh, policy, you know, we'll still have unions come up and organize to assert higher wages? Yeah, unions are the main force behind the minimum wage. Uh, you never see 
minimum wage workers protesting for increases. In fact, they usually don't even know that it's been passed. Um, and it's unions that are behind it entirely. They can be exposed on this, but unions are losing, um, especially industrial unions, are losing their economic clout. And so that's another reason why it would be easier today than ever before, than ever before since they were first passed, to um, go after the minimum wage law, politically at least, um, because uh, industrial unions are at their weakest point ever. So thank you very much.